Uh, good morning. Or as we say sometimes, good morning. Um, I, I've thought a lot, um, you know, I, well, I got invited some time ago for this talk, and I never give a prepared talk. So it's easy for me to do, to say what's on my mind. Uh, I've thought a little bit about my talk, but there's been so many wonderful talks and people doing such marvelous, fabulous things and, you know, um, dreaming up what to do with their lives and with passion and energy and focus and intention and going out and do things in the world. And um, so I was thinking, like, what do I do? And, you know, I don't do much. So um, this becomes a problem then as far as what to talk about. <laughs> I've spent um, approximately 30,000 hours sitting still, not talking, facing the wall. It's called Zen meditation. No, you know, and Malcolm Gladwell says, it's Malcolm Gladwell, right? He's the one who says, 10,000 hours and you're a virtuoso. I don't know 30,000 hours what I'm a virtuoso at, except for I'm pretty good at being me. So you see, this is the product here. And um, some of you uh, will appreciate this product, and others of you will. No, thank you. And then some of you will find ways to use this product or interact with this product, and others of you will turn the other direction. And you won't find you know, much at all to do with this product. You know, this is the way we all are. So, um, but you know, really here at the beginning, uh, before I tell you more about that, and there's a surprising amount to tell you, about 30,000 hours of sitting quietly without moving. Uh, there's a lot, um, I could tell you. But as a kind of um, part of this, or a piece of this, I'd like to, well, a little background on this. I want to invite, you know, some s spirit into the room, if I may. Is that all right with you? And if you'd like, you're welcome to join me in this. I will help you out with that. But, you know, I got here, um, I flew from California, I got to London, and, and eventually here. And I stood up by where I'm staying, out on the grass, and it's all wet and, you know, misty. It was actually a little, it was pretty clear. And I, I stand there, and I'm trying to sink roots into the ground. And the ground is like, I don't think so. <laughs> So I thought, okay, I'm, I'm, help me out here, you know. And I touched the ground. I'm here. I, DNA. I'm here. I'm a visitor from California. And I'd like all the spirits and deities of this place, forest, to welcome me. I'm a visitor. And please allow me to stay here with you and to be in your space. And then at first I felt like, you know, oh, yeah, so you're from California, huh? <laughs> you think you could just kind of, you get in here with us? You just <laughs> kind of, you just got here? <laughs> I said, yeah. I'm here and I'd like to be to hang with you, and I'd like you to hang with me. I want you to, you know, inform me. I want you to be in my heart. I want to welcome you into my heart, into my life. And then I felt um, a rather poignant sadness. The spirits and, you know, deities in this area, I think, have been neglected. Who invites them? Who asks for them to be here? Who welcomes their presence? And I come from California to do this. It's, so after that, 
roots go down. And when I walk here, um, you know, my, um, we say in Zen, I meet myself wherever I go. The rock walls, some of them big slabs of rocks, some of them flat, some of them, you know, aligned up sideways and then this way, and, uh, you know, uh, places in the walls to walk through, and, and all the little, and all the plants and the creatures here, and the weather, and I've asked it to be uh, with me. So I want to do this with you to invite, um, you know, and it's what, just, you know, one can go on and on about these things, but, you know, years ago, I don't know, is it 30 years now, Jerry Mander wrote a book, In the Absence of the Sacred. Where is it? Where is the sacred in, you know, our lives? It's hard for me to find, you know, so, you know, you, it's not out there. It, the sacred is, you, you, you have to, you bring it into your own life. That's how you do it. You have to, you embody the sacred and you meet the sacred. And it's called, uh, you know, focusing very directly, quietly on something, as so many of you do in your lives and in your work, that it begins to um, inform you. And instead of uh, telling everything, you know, what to do and how to behave, you let it come to you. And then you know what to do because it comes to you. So I'm going to, um, this is a short kind of invocation, and if you'd like, you can join me. Um, and I'll say, um, uh, I'll say, tell you what to say. I'm going to hit the bell, and then you can say it with me, okay? We're going to start with Grandfather Son. Not just any old Grandfather Son, but Grandfather Son, the Welch Grandfather Son. <laughs> just so we know, in case there's any difference here, that we're talking about the one that's here, for here, for this place, okay? We call on the Welch grandfather's son. We okay, so you got that? All right, now, you're, we're doing this together, right? So tune, tune yourself to the room. Tune yourself to the others in the room, okay? You tune yourself, and I'll say, we call on, and then you repeat after me, and you... And you'll see, we're going we're gonna to tune in with each other and we're going to say it together. All right? We call on the Welch grandfather's son. Now you. We call on the Welch grandfather's son. You notice the difference? <laughs> you tuned. Okay, now you're in tune. And we bring that son here to this place, to this space, down to earth here. Okay? We call on the Welsh Grandmother Earth. Uh, here, this place, Forest Farm. We call on the sacred plants. We call on the sacred animals. all the animals, all the plants of this place. To abide here. We call on sacred humans. We call on all the ancestors. We call on all the ancestors. Ancestors, in this case, your ancestors, the ancestors of this place, the ancestors of these people, and then all the spiritual ancestors that you may want to invite. I have a lot of them. You may have some too. 
We want them all here to be in this place, in this space, in this time, right here with us, in our hearts, you know, for our power and energy and strength. Okay? So let's do it one more time and bring in who you want here with you. Okay? We call on the ancestors, the human ancestors and sacred ancestors. And then, uh, last for now, I want to make sure that the deities, the local, the local spirits, guardian deities, I want to invite all of them to be here with us, uh, to nourish and support us, to sustain us, to protect us, to guide us, to enter into the marrow of the bones, to, to be in the breath in your heart right here with us, okay? You notice the room now? It works, okay? Thank you for that. Uh, this uh, so this sacred space. Um, one of the qualities of sacred space is it's a place where you can learn things, you can study carefully, and you can find things out, and you can know for yourself what's what. And you know for yourself what's what because you know for yourself what's what. You don't take someone else's word for it. You don't go to school to learn this. I dropped out of college. I was taking social psychology and, you know, all kinds of things. You know, I wrote a paper about alienation and anxiety. I got an A. I was just as alienated and anxious as ever. <laughs> Is that good for something? And they call this school and education. You know, take in this stuff and give it back to us. I don't understand that. I want to learn. I want to know something about my life about me and how to be a human being. That's what I wanted right from the start. So um, my brother sent me a Zen story about a young man. Um, in those days, 1965, there was maybe two books on Zen. One of them was Paul Rep's book, Zen Flesh, Zen Bones. So my brother sent me a story, and it's right before Xerox machines. <laughs> so he wrote it out by hand. A young man writes home to his mother how well he's doing in school, getting good grades, writing great papers. She writes back, Dear son, I didn't raise you to be a walking dictionary. Why don't you go to the mountains and attain true realization? So I thought that's for me, and I dropped out at the end of the year. It said, Reasons for leaving. I put, Go to the mountains and attain true realization. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Uh, in less than two years, I was in the mountains at the first North America Zen monastery, Tassajara. And I actually got there um, uh, in 1966, the year before, and I started, um, I was uh, already practicing meditation, and then I got a job in the kitchen, and I washed dishes, um, and then they were making bread, and I learned how to make bread. They taught me, I said, can I learn how to make bread? They said, sure. So they taught me to make bread. You know, this led to a few years later. I wrote a bread book, and it sold 300, uh, you know, um, three quarters of a million copies. <laughs> How did that happen? I don't know. But I had a dream too. I mean, when I was ten, I I ate I had bread at my uh, aunt's house in Washington D.C. It was so good. Why aren't we making bread? Why aren't we eating things out of packages? What happened? What happened to people? Why did people just abandon their capacity to see, smell, taste, touch, cook, you know, craft? What, why did we abandon it? You know, now the Western world here, you know, we don't need to colonize anybody. We just colonize our own people. 
you can't do anything by our product. And I got, you know, boxes of letters from people. That book came out in 1970. <laughs> so now people bake. Uh, it's pretty amazing. But we were, we were not eating only packaged bread, but it was packaged white bread, puffy white bread. So I learned to make bread, and then um, I kept on meditating. Anyway, one thing led to another. Um, so 30 years, 30,000 hours of sitting. I want to tell you a little bit about that. Um, I want to tell you a little bit, you know, um, some people say, wasn't that hard for you? Wasn't that hard for you to sit quietly and not do anything? And, you know, this is, you know, you get up at, oh, 3.30, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, you sit in the, there's no heat there. You sit in the cold. And then, you know, we'd work all day. And in those days, we were doing all the work. Now, you know, the Zen people, they just hire people to build their buildings. We built our own buildings. <laughs> we built a kitchen with, you know, three foot wide stone walls at the base. And then the walls go up from there, a foot and a half, 18 inches thick. Okay. 18 inches thick. And we built that building by hand, hauling everything by hand. You know, we... And anyway, but to tell you just briefly here, because my time is already running out. <laughs> Another time, folks. Um, so as I said, anyway, there's so much to tell you about 30,000 hours. But um, it took me a long time, you know, and I left Zen Center after 20 years. 20 years. I was only up to about 10,000, uh, 20,000 hours then. So I figure in the, it, since then, it's only been another 10,000 over the last 25 or 30 years. Um, anyway, wasn't it hard? No, it wasn't hard because that was me. That's who I am. And it's hard to know what that is, isn't it? Who you are, who I am. And it was only later I thought, you know, I realized one year my brother sent me a letter. I, he was, I was depressed. My brother sent me an email and he said, he wrote me and he found a letter that my father had written to my aunt, uh, uncle uh, after my birth. And it said, the baby was born a month premature. My mother was named Frances. Franny came home from the hospital a week later, April 1st. The baby came home April the 16th. So she had a very good rest. What was happening to baby Eddie was completely unremarkable. Then, um, when I was three, my mother died. I, and then a few days later, I was at an orphanage for four years before my father remarried. And, at the, and then when I got there, I was the youngest boy, the youngest kid, the smallest. I sat in a rocker on the porch for a week, wouldn't play with anyone. So 20 years of Zen practice is that post-traumatic reenactment from being born premature. Two weeks, I did my first meditation, two weeks. After a week out of the womb, two weeks. They weren't holding babies in 1948. So I did my first meditation intensive um, between up to th you know between one and three weeks, and then I did my second meditation intensive uh, a month you know a few days after my mother died in 1948. So or was or was I getting ready for my future destiny? <laughs> Do you know if you follow the James Hillman uh, Souls Code and um, Robert Bly and people you know. We all come into this life with a purpose. We're here to do something, and we have our purpose. We have our life lessons. We have what we came here to do, and so many of you have found it. It's, it's really sweet. So um, now I'm convinced, you know, I came here to be this person. And, you know, my name is Edward, so I'm, I tell people I'm always headed Edward, headed towards Edward. <laughs> Listen, so um, uh, 
so much to talk about, but I want to tell you a poem uh, to finish up with. Um, this is a poem by a friend of mine named Kay Ryan. Kay Ryan is this year, um, she may have just finished being the United States Poet Laureate. Um, and uh, one of the uh, wonderful stories that Kay's told me is that she was getting, you know, for years, rejections for her poems. She finally changed her mailbox. And she put in a big red, bright red mailbox, oversized. <laughs> And then she started getting all these acceptances for her poems. <laughs> Very mysterious, isn't it? So this is a poem of hers um, to, uh, to leave it with. Um, it's called On the Nature of Understanding. <clears throat> Say you hoped to tame something wild Say you hope to tame something wild and stayed calm and inched up day by day. Or even not tame it, but to meet it halfway. Things went along. You made progress. Understanding it would be a lengthy process. Sensing changes in your hair and nails. So it's startling when it attacks. You thought you had a deal. <laughs>